so yes, I'll be filming. Okay. So today, and I'm gonna, we're featuring Marley Molina in Second Life here, of course, Neela Miller, and I'm gonna paste your little brief bio in for you. Uh, but Marley um, is an uh, has an MS in Education and Communication, and she's a just alt therapist and also a Jungian process worker. She's an educator, a trainer, facilitator, coach, and a, a multifaceted artist. Um, and then uh, with her background and all of that, with her background and all of that, um, she began Second Life and she was excited about the creative possibilities for learning, teaching, and pro uh, promoting human potential and growth. And um, you may know her from the fact that she created the creative explore uh, the octagon creative exploration group in second life which offers programs using arts processes for personal growth and educational ventures employing her skills on, in gestalt and Jungian modalities and group dynamics um, and this summer also um, I mean uh, Marley is going to also be open offering a deeper workshop um, for those wanting uh, more on symbolic modeling and training and you can go to that link for more info and you can visit Marley's site at peoplesystemspotential.com. So, um, and thank you, Marley, for coming here today. And uh, what I wanted to start off with is if you can tell us something, um, if you can tell us something about your background and work life before Second Life, we can start off that way. Uh, well, first, I'd like uh, to introduce my assistant, Francisco Kuhlhoven. We call him Fran who's been with me a number of years now, who explain what these objects of mine are on either side of the stage. Fran? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, on the right-hand side of the stage, as you're looking at it, there's a multicolored uh, half-cylinder that's our group joiner. You can click on that to join Marley's group, Octagon Creative Exploration. Um, we also at her site, we do not have one sitting out here, but there is a subscriber board that you can click on as well. On the left-hand side, as you're looking at the stage, there's a blue mushroom-shaped object. That, uh, If you click on that, that will give you a copy of Marley's um, program information and some other information about her that you can take with you. Um, also, I, I I know that Molly wanted to mention that um, that she and Le, and Lucena have also created a new group called Adventures in Lifelong Learning. Um, that's open enrollment. We don't have a joiner setting out for that, but that's something you, you can talk about more later. Um, and also, she's going to be using that media board that's behind her, up on, sitting at the edge of the stage. If you, uh, when it gets time to see it, you may need to click on one of those panels in order to, to see what she's talking about. And you want to make sure that you have your media enabled for it to work. Okay, if you have any technical problems with any of that during the program, you can send me an IM and I'll help with it. Okay, and uh, Liz, uh, Wisdom Seeker, who we call Liz, uh, is putting out the description of the lifelong learning group that she and I have just created. So if, if it's something that interests you, please join us, because we really see it as a collaborative venture. So I think now we can go back to your first question. Let me re like, ask you that. So, Marley, um, tell us something about your background and your work before you came to Second Life. Okay, well, you've kind of summarized it. I could probably cut out half of what I'm saying, but 
uh, uh, in order for you all to understand the transfer of uh, interests and skills from my life before Second Life uh, and still going on, it, help, it will help to know my story. Uh, I was born and brought up in New York City, and I grew up in a family of artistic souls. And my mother was a dancer, a writer, and a painter. And my father, aunt, and uncles were all musicians. Uh, uh, even though he did something else for a living, but he always he played the violin, and he and his brothers also had a trio for a while. <clears throat> I went to a special school called the High School of Music and Art in New York. It's now called LaGuardia High School. When I went there, it was just music and art. Now it's added dan the dance and drama from performing arts. If any of you ever saw the uh, movie Fame, it was about that school. And that uh, school now turns out graduates in every art form. Throughout my long life, I've been involved with the arts. I play several instruments. I did a lot of singer-songwriting stuff and was a folk singer. And to this day, I'm a composer for a piano and choir. And I've put out uh, several CDs. I do fine arts, especially drawing, printmaking, and collage. And I've written several books, both fiction and nonfiction. Early in my life, I've also been a dancer and I've been involved even more recently in theater as an actor, a director, a costumer, and other aspects. When I started working, I taught guitar and taught English and drama in a big high school uh, after acquiring a master's degree in education and in communications. And then I became a Gestalt therapist and also studied and incorporated many aspects of humanistic education and psychology. Uh, let me say a bit about humanistic uh, psychology for those unfamiliar with it. Fran is going to give you links so you can read more about it yourself. <clears throat> uh, this is a little clip from Wikipedia. Um, humanistic psychology is a psychological perspective which rose to prominence in the mid-20th century in response to the limitations of Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory and B.F. Skinner's behaviorism. Uh, it adopts a holistic approach to human existence and pays special attention to such phenomena as creativity, free will, and positive human potential. It encourages viewing ourselves as a whole person greater than the sum of our parts. That's the Gestalt idea right there and encourages self-exploration rather than the study of behavior in other people. Humanistic psychology acknowledges spiritual aspiration as an integral part of the human psyche. Some pioneers uh, associated with this field include Abraham Maslow, which is, who is really one of the uh, <clears throat> forerunners of all of it, Carl Rogers, Virginia Satir and Fritz Perls, many, many others, many of whom I have the great good fortune to know, to work with, uh, to work alongside of, to host, uh, and those were grand, grand days. Um, so, uh, and also my experience at Antioch College also prepared me for leadership, for working with groups for collaboration and a bunch of other useful skills. So for 12 years, I was with a work group called the Associates for Human Resources. And uh, this was in Concord, Massachusetts, and did a combination of graduate level teaching, running groups, seeing clients for therapy, uh, both individually and in groups and doing work with organizations. And then I created my own business called People Systems Potential, which you, if you take, uh, click on the blue mushroom, you'll, you'll have all that information there, and you'll know how to get to it. And I, I still have that business to this day. And you can go to my website to get descriptions and samples of the variety 
of tools and approaches I offer. Something about my books. I've worked a lot with activists, with transgenders, with artists, as well as coaches and therapists and educators. And I have to say, I'm very honored to be here today among so many people who are doing such good work in the world. <clears throat> I really feel great uh, respect and love for what you're doing. Uh, I've worked in just about every setting you can imagine. Uh, corporate environments, a lot of nonprofits, military, medical, educational. And I've also created a few organizations which served special purposes. My main work, other than doing direct therapy or coaching, has consisted of ways to enable people professionals of all kinds to be more creative and empowered in the way they do their work with people. An important context is that I'm a process person, so the kinds of skills I apply can work really in any type of setting where there are people working together. What attracted you uh, to being here, to, to, to discovering and becoming and being here in Second Life? Well, I have to tell you the story of how I found out about it. It was 2007, it was October, and I was at a yearly uh, social and educational event for transgendered persons that I worked at for like 25 years. Uh, and I was sitting at a table with one of the community leaders and her partner. And she told me that she, uh, who was transgendered herself, uh, she told me about Second Life, introduced me to a partner who she, she said she met in here, and they're still together after all these years. Uh, and the minute she started talking about this place, I realized that I could bring in a lot of what I do and know and refashion it with the technology that was available here. There was only one problem. I was a total technophobe. I was just afraid of, of everything having to do with uh, managing this, this kind of environment. And uh, even though I had a computer, for probably 20 years, I still felt like a beginner. Uh, but but my, my creative curiosity trumped my technophobia. So I asked her if she would mentor me. Uh, and I came in, and I'm telling you, it makes a huge difference to have somebody kind of holding your hand along the way. And I always... Um, advise that for people, new people coming in. Either I hold their hand or I try to find somebody else who does. <clears throat> um, so that's what uh, attracted me, you know, like I thrive on creativity and innovation, experimentation, teaching and learning. And all of these things uh, have a big place in Second Life. That's great. I think that drew, uh, that is a draw for a lot of us. That um, the creativity, the collaborativeness of things, uh, you know, so uh, wonderful and a wonderful story that you met actually at a professional conference and under such um, things. So I know that um, you know we we mentioned Octagon and some other things, but um, what projects have you been working on since you've discovered Second Life or since you've been here? Well, I need to say, first of all, that I really felt I owed a debt to this community leader uh, in the transgender community. So one of the first things I did was to run support groups here for transgender persons, because when I came in, there weren't any. There was a hospitality center, but there really wasn't anybody helping them uh, work on their own issues and this was a wonderful and safe place to do that. And then after a while I decided to train uh, transgendered persons who had some kind of counseling or teaching background to run their own groups. 
And so I trained, I don't know, eight or ten people, and then they started doing groups on their own. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to do uh, a lot of things that involved arts processes. And uh, when you look at my program chart, you'll see, uh, that's in the Blue Mushroom, I think, you'll see uh, uh, descriptions, it's all also on my website under projects, of, of different kinds of programs I do here. They have certain elements which involve being able to engage people in creating symbolic representations of either their inner and interpersonal experiences or ideas or uh, ways of engaging people in expressing themselves in a variety, of, a variety of ways in a community context. And I'm going to try to give you some examples of that. So, you see this board behind me. Um, and in the upper right quadrant, you'll see something that I, <clears throat> I did a little while ago with a friend. You see that there are two different representations of, uh, of freedom. Now, you can use your camera controls to bend the board, however, you need to to see it better. So, she, she was on the right side of the board. I was on the left side. Uh, and we, uh, we did these, uh, we took the idea of freedom and each made spontaneous drawings. And you could see that they're quite different from each other, although there are one or two things, like she has a little spiral uh, <clears throat> in the lower center, and I've got a couple of those. And then uh, what I usually do is uh, have people role play what it is they create, and that's the Gestalt part, uh, because in Gestalt work, uh, the idea is to uh, incorporate dissociated parts of the self that you put out there to take a look at and to assimilate them even more into your psyche. So I might say something like, I'm, this is part is unrehearsed, folks. Uh, well, I start at the bottom at the roots of my experience. And I'm enclosed by my family traditions. Uh, and the roots are quite strong, especially that one on the left there. Uh, and uh, I feel as though uh, I'm, I have my, my mother and my father on either side of me. That's funny, I haven't thought about it that way before. Because every time you do one of these, you, you gain insight or perspective that you can never get from just thinking or talking alone. Then I start moving up in my life and I wiggle around. That's my green part is growing and I'm going in different directions. I'm not quite sure uh, where I'm going. And then suddenly I burst out. I burst out into this warm realization of uh, that what I love is the human psyche and uh, exploring it in different ways and uh, educating, teaching, and learning. And then I, I have another part of me over uh, what's going to be on your right side, uh, which is this, this growing plant, these leaves uh, that are, are growing because I'm feeling like with this freedom, I can... Uh, plant whatever I want and grow whatever I want. Okay, so that's that's an idea. Now, my friend would, uh, might have talked about being behind bars or being uh, caught in a web and then, and then suddenly figuring out how to come out of that and then uh, speaking as that uh, happy uh, entity on top. Uh, but she's not here, so she can't do it for herself. So I'm just giving an example of how that might work. Now, uh, let's just play a little. I'd like someone to give me the name of a, of a strong, of a feeling state. And feel free to maybe type that out, too. 
Yeah. Okay, happy and joyful. Those are the first two I saw. Okay, so I go over to the board. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, if we had time, of course, my preference would be to involve all of you uh, in this, although someone can try playing on the right side uh, in the right quadrant, but I'm going to use the left quadrant here. Uh, and uh, let's see. Okay, so in order to do this, the way this board works, and by the way, if you want to write the, the name Maximilian Merlin down, some of you may even know him. I haven't looked to see whether he's here today. He, he took this web board that originally would only retain images for one minute and then would fade out and figured out how to fix it so that images stay until I erase them. So I go over to the uh, where the crayons are on the left side and I click on a crayon and I'm off. Happiness and joy. Ta -dum, ta -dum. Ta -dum, ta -dum. Ta -dum, ta -dum. Okay, I, I sing also when I do these things. Uh, and then something about green. Almost looks like Christmas. Something about green. I can fill it in. I can do whatever. Okay, so I have this thing that represents happiness and joy for me. And now, uh, if I become that, just like I'm a character in a play, I would say, I'm a red line that just zigzags all over the place and just moves freely in the world. And uh, this gives me uh, my character, which is joy and happiness. I'm also uh, like a green funnel that moves up and out. And, uh, and it ha uh, I, as green, have a slightly different kind of uh, uh, character or uh, quality. Uh, it, it, it's a more, uh, it's a sweeter, more peaceful kind of uh, joy. The other is uh, like I'm dancing on a dance floor and just letting go. This, this more comes from, I can see now, I'm having an insight right now, that the center of me has a kind of a quiet, rotating joyfulness that that stays in my center and moves up and informs everything else I do. Okay, so that's an example of how I might use the drawing board. Now, if I'm working with two different people, uh, these drawings can talk to each other. Different parts of the drawings can talk to each other. And whenever you work this way, perhaps you can now see or imagine that you get different perspectives you would discover things as you go along. This can be used in a classroom, this can, uh, in, in Second Life, uh, with students who are exploring ideas. They might have different ways of conceiving of those ideas. With people who are doing counseling, uh, I work occasionally with people who want to have decisions they need to make in their life or are uh, working on some kind of challenge uh, and want to have more clarity about it and something about externalizing the uh, image of whatever it is helps people because they're going to be working with the image <clears throat> rather than just staying locked inside their own thought process. Uh, later on, you can ask uh, questions, so make, make sure if you have them to jot them down because we will sp spend the last little period of time for that. Um, I just wanted to show you one other thing. The majority of work I've done before I got the uh, building board, uh, the uh, drawing board, was uh, with, with the building tools. So, I'm going to take that same idea
And the other important thing I need to tell you is that I always have people connect with their bodies at the computer at home. The body is like a barometer and gives you information about what it is you're creating on the screen. And at some point, the body will say, no, make that larger or, or make it a different color. Uh, and then there'll be a click in your body mind and, and something will say, that's it. And then you can tell whoever's guiding you, and in this case, it would be me, uh, all right, that, that, that's the right thing for me now. Now I'm going to do color. First of all, I'm going to get the texture up and make it blank so I don't get the wood part because I want something like this. And I want something like that. Okay, I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but you can see I'm on the way to creating something that feels like happiness and joy to me. Now, if you did it, you might choose a completely different shape, a different color, have a different story. And that is really exciting because different people have different ways of characterizing uh, what it is they're doing and what they're feeling and what they're thinking. Um, yes, so this way of uh, characterizing or symbolically representing ideas, feeling states, values, uh, challenges, um, group decisions, just practically anything. Uh, gives you a whole other way of using the technology in here that, frankly, I haven't seen used this way by other people. And that's why I'm so excited to offer it as a training uh, later on this year. Uh, some other kinds of things that I've done, I've brought improvisers, uh, musicians and artists together to be inspired by each other's channels of expression. So. <clears throat> I can take this away now. So, uh, for instance, I'll have a musician watch what the artist is doing. Uh, so part of the learning for the musician is to come out of their usual channel, auditory channel, and use their visual channel. They'll watch what the artist is doing and then improvise music that somehow goes with what they're seeing and vice versa. Sometimes the artist will watch, listen to the musician and then create something. I also do something called collaborative sculptures where I invite people once a month up on the roof of my gallery to come and build things together and then make stories out of them. And usually the stories have some kind of personal meaning for people. Uh, I also have um, salons in which people share their experiences and uh, people who've had a great impact on them or books or films or we discuss an idea like creative process. I've, I've done and continue to do a lot of collaborating on projects here. And if any of you are, are coming to the SL birthday celebration, you'll see uh, our whole co cohort from Imagination Island have created a play together, which illustrates in brief and probably in a funny way, some of the programs and projects that we offer in it. Uh, hopefully in an entertaining fashion. So the possibilities for creating here and in your organizations and uh, in all of these kinds of venues are really endless, aren't they? Yeah, I, 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 they are. And I know when we, um, uh, when we talk... Inspiration. Uh, sorry, I always... <laughs> that's all right. Inspiration Island, not in Massachusetts. Okay. <laughs> Um, I know when we, we spoke before about this, you know, I, I thought it was neat that you are in some ways using these virtual tools in this visual way to kind of 
manifest things that might not even be, they're not visible things normally, even though they're still very much part of like, you know, your reality of a, a person or of a, an organization or a process, you know, that it's sort of bringing visual, um, kind of a visual metaphor to something, to that, an idea. So that's great that um, all these ways that you are. Yeah, and I think we've kind of covered the, la the last thing that we were going to talk about going forward. I mean, the two big things in my mind are this this new group that Liz and I have formed called Adventures in Lifelong Learning. I'm very excited to see what will come up out of that. And we are particularly interested in uh, elder education and uh, learning right up until the moment one drops dead. Uh, and all the ways that that can happen here. Uh, and this tr training that I'd like to do in symbolic modeling. And if any of you are, are intrigued, you can, uh, uh, I am Fran, who's keeping track of all this for me, and let him know, because initially we're going to have a fairly small, intensive group, a core group that's going to help develop how this might be also be offered uh, in the future. Uh, and so now I think we're ready for Q and A, right? Yep. If anybody has questions, that would be great. Um, best thing to do would be to put them into chat, and then I can speak them aloud. So if you have any questions or wonder if there's a way to use this, um, use these kind of processes and. Uh, in your own kind of work that or or uh, problem solving, you can kind of talk about that. Uh, yeah. Yes, if you have ideas or things come to you, you're making associations about applications. That would be very interesting also for you to share. So questions or applications. Don't be shy. <laughs> now have ever uh, I have a question sort of more to the audience and hopefully to prompt folks. Have you ever used any sort of way um, like design thinking or systems thinking or even you know what we're talking about here sort of using like a um, you know metaphorical symbolic thinking for your problem solving? Well all of it is metaphorical and symbolic really and I'm glad you mentioned systems thinking. I don't know if people here are familiar with the work of Kurt Lewin, field theory. Uh, I've got a climate change uh, skybox. I have three locations on top of each other. One is the gallery on the ground floor, then the octagon, and then the third one is the climate change one. That's an example, if anyone wants to see it, of taking a content area and doing this work. So we developed all kinds of attitudes about climate change, regardless of the hard data, attitudes and feelings people have about this issue across the climate change spectrum. We put them up on large charts. We put other things. My ex-husband is uh, an expert on visual language and has made a lot of charts of uh, what he calls social messes. Um, and it's up there. And uh, five or six people came and actually made models of different positions uh, along the spectrum. Now the importance of that in terms of systems thinking is that the more positions you can empathize with or occupy rather than staying in your own fixed position, the better able you are to be creative about solutions to sticky and difficult problems. And Thank you, Mitch. <clears throat> and um, 
uh, Glitteracta Convention 2, um, so Cavern Studios, which is in essence the host of uh, nonprofit comments here, they actually use, um, to, your, to the point of um, using symbolic thinking, um, uh, symbolic modeling, they use actually design thinking, which is often used for like a, you know, a kind of iterative process for products or services in a way. They're actually using it to, for problem solving, um, for uh, problem solving within nonprofits and then being able to actually try to hopefully design solutions from. Um, so it's interesting to sort of see these things, you know, which um, often have other applications kind of hijacked for social good or, you know, hijacked. Um, you know, in the case of like, you know, you're kind of hijacking the, mixing up the second life experience to be able to use it for, um, you know, kind of counseling and, and, and insight, you know, so it's interesting kind of to see. Education, yeah, yeah because yeah. Uh, it, it has a lot of applications to different kinds of content areas. That's why it, it, it is also valuable for educators thinking about different ways of engaging their students here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that it, we're just at the beginning of developing this. You know, the things I did today, folks, the, I had to be very short. But when we actually do a process, you know, we, we take longer and explore different aspects of or different ways of uh, relating to the object being inside it. How does that change your thinking, uh, being on top of it, making it different sizes? And people, uh, often will have this strong insight, oh, I create my reality, here I am doing it on this screen, and it can be anything I want it to be, and what happens if I take charge of it and change it? How does that affect my thinking and my feeling and so on? <clears throat> I, I'm trying, I, I, you know, when I speak, I'm not able to also watch the chat at the same time, so now I'm taking a look at, at what Howard's saying. Learning curve is much to overcome. Yes. That's right. And it really helps to have a personal mentor who's willing to help you through all that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was um, interested and intrigued by you brought up the whole idea of the initially sort of paying off that debt of uh, and helping the transgender community. Now, um, what was that kind of facilitating counseling and then sort of almost training the trainers of uh, for them to do their own support groups. What was that kind of a bit like a bit more? What was it like? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, uh, a number of people who, who uh, ventured forth and had the courage to come to these groups said they had never talked in public to anyone about themselves uh, and they were so relieved that there was a place where if they if they felt they needed to, they could exit any time they wanted to, but that they were with other people who could understand them. Many lived in isolated rural areas where there, where there was no help uh, in the physical world or, you know, in other countries. Uh, and they were they were a great comfort to each other. So, you know, the more I can uh, assist people to help each other and not be in the position of, quote, the expert, the better I like it. Uh, they, If they wanted to, they could go and get a book that I wrote for counselors about this called Counseling in Genderland, which was on Amazon. But I really wanted them to develop the skills of being supportive to each other and to learn when it helps and doesn't help uh, to share your own experience, uh, how to not be intrusive by giving people direct advice, uh, but letting them make discoveries on their own. There were all kinds of process skills uh, that were involved in doing these support groups. So that by the time I got a group of people who actually wanted to be trained in facilitating them, they already had models for the different kinds of interventions that we did and the things that went on in the group. That's great. Yeah, they can just, they can go just to Amazon and like get it for now for a couple of dollars. It's just uh, <laughs> I, I I wrote that book by the way before there were a lot of transsexuals out. So mainly I was writing about my work with crossdressers, 
Um, now, of course, <laughs> there's been a huge uh, change and outing of uh, you know people coming out uh, in the community. Uh, we know about the whole gender thing, but there's more, a lot more happening now. Uh, so, but, uh, so I wrote the book in the mid nineties, but the information for counseling is still good because what I'm doing in that book as a gestalt is asking people who work with this population to look at their own prejudices, just as I had to do, uh, their, their own, uh, mythology about this population, uh, their confusions and so on, and work through that stuff in order to be good helpers. And that's the direct, direct link to that, in case you're looking for it. Um, any other questions, um, you know, on the process stuff or any other um, things that might that come to mind? I mean, I think I think the the collaborative drawing tool itself is kind of a neat thing that could be, you know, used. I mean, you're using it here for this sort of way, but I think it's a great group tool, too, um, no matter. Uh, yes, and I think that Max is willing to uh, give people a copy of this drawing board if they ask him. It's Maxim, did you write his name? Maximilian Merlin. Yes, we shared it before. So any other questions or thoughts? Well, I hope that you uh, found this uh, of value and interesting. If you have afterthoughts, you can always uh, IM me, uh, come visit the Octagon, take a look at the climate change uh, platform, uh, visit the gallery where I have a whole exhibit of visions of self, different parts of my own psyche in one uh, wing and in the other wing of this butterfly gallery, I, I have uh, other people's uh, work and I will change that from time to time. I, I, I didn't have time to talk about all the things I do, but you'll you'll see it on the uh, on the card that's in that um, mushroom if you took it. So one question that did just come up, what work does the therapist need to do for him or herself to be a good helper? And I I guess oh, you that's such a big question. <laughs> That is such a big question. But, you know, it helps to be aware of, of your own, um, uh, your ego, you know, the kind, kinds of things you do that piss people off. <laughs> I have great examples of that for myself. Uh, learning how to be more empathic and sensitive uh, to other people's kinds of learning styles and ways of being and not assume that everybody is like you. Uh, do you know that until I got to college, I assumed that all children were raised in, in households like mine, where there was art, music, and books going on, and I found out that a great majority of people didn't have that stuff at all. They had to discover it later in their lives. That had a huge impact on me, you know, what I was assuming uh, about that, all of that. So, uh, but, it, you know, I don't really have time to answer that. However, if you go to my website, there is a, a part of it that's called Something for You. Uh, and it's archived, so you can just keep clicking on it. There are a lot of different tools in there, free for the, for the looking or the taking, that might help uh, with answering that question. Yeah, uh, that's great. And then some of that, uh, I think, really parallels to you know, we brought up the other things, and I think that's a kind of a key common wisdom, and it goes along with the design thinking as well, like not to take for granted that your point of view is everybody's point of view, you know, so. Absolutely. And that's why I like to work with a lot of sensory channels. I have some background in neuro-linguistic programming, which some of you may be uh, familiar with. You know, why I have musicians work with artists and vice versa. Uh, why I use uh, words and role play and uh, as many different sensory and uh, arts process channels as I can so that you know different people can get it in different ways. 
great. So, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm delighted that you all came, and uh, you know, please feel free to contact me if you have afterthoughts, or come and visit, or come to my groups. Uh, if you came in late, there's a group joiner that uh, rainbow color thing that you can click on. Or if you come to Inspiration Island, listen, <laughs> you're going to hit me over the head. Uh, uh, you'll find my uh, parcel of the octagon and uh, or the uh, gallery, and you'll see a, sub a subscriber board right on the outside of the gallery if you have too many groups already. <clears throat> Great. Thank you for this, Martin. I think it was good to kind of give um, an overall over. Um, kind of overview of these things. And check out, I mean, the links are also on the nonprofitcommons.org site itself. So if you need like her link to her site or the link to the series of um, kind of trainings and workshops, if you're interested in those, those are there too. And we'll publish these also in the the transcript. So, you know, you'll be able to kind of get those. I mean, and you know, and I would say check them out, take them, take advantage if you're interested because uh, you are doing them for free, right? So it's a kind of a, uh, a good opportunity to learn the experience. So of how to use these tools. Um, so oh, I, I, always, I always welcome donations, but yes, sure. I'm going to be, uh, I, I'm not going to uh, charge any particular fee. Great. Thank you. So let's thank Marley. Um, and I'm going to jump back over to, um, to text. But, um, you know, thank you, Marley, and, uh, you know, feel free to contact back to her. And, of course, you know, if you joined us today, you know, join the TechSoup uh, group, and, uh, you know, you can hear kind of more of this when we have more presentations. So.